This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 194, recorded on July 23rd, 2012. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Today we're heading back to Madison, Wisconsin, where I had a conversation with five early career scientists. And this took place on the night before TWIV 193, which was, of course, recorded at the American Society for Virology Meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. You may remember on TWIV 189, I had a conversation with five postdoctoral fellows in Glasgow, Scotland, at the Center for Virus Research. And at the end of that conversation, I thought it would be really important and interesting to have a similar conversation with early career virologists Uh, here in the U.S. So I put out a call on TWIV 189 for participants. I also put out a call on Twitter and on Google+. And I had five individuals volunteering to sit down with me and have a conversation about their careers. So what follows is that conversation that I had in Madison, Wisconsin with Matthew Doherty, John David DeJong, Helen Lazier, Stephen Oliver, and Kara Pager about their careers as postdocs, what they hope to do with their scientific careers, with their laboratories, and what worries them about science in general. So stay tuned for that conversation. I'll be back when it's over for a few closing words. So I have corralled five virologists here in Madison at the American Society for Virology meeting. It's, uh, what's today? July 23rd, uh, 2012. And I thought this would be a good segue to our Glasgow episode where I spoke with virologists there, early career virologists, I can call you that. So let's go around the table, We're sitting in a nice quiet room here uh, at the Monona Terrace And uh, let's go around the table and introduce yourselves, starting with you. Could you share your name? I'm uh, J.D. DeYoung, uh, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow with Sarah Wooten at the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, uh, at the Ontario Veterinary College. Okay. And we work on uh, simple beta retroviruses. They're actually oncogenic simple beta retroviruses of caprine hosts. So this would be sheep and goats. Okay. We'll come back and get more detail on on that. But before you were a, so you're a postdoc at Guelph, where was your PhD? Well, you know, this is, this is going to get funny. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been at Guelph for my undergrad, uh, a master's degree, a PhD degree, and now uh, postdocing all at the University of Guelph. So yeah, we can talk yeah. about wow. the follies of those sorts of decisions. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, you bend, up, bend over backwards, I might like put a tablecloth over yeah. you and become <laughs> part of the furniture. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can just move into an office. <laughs> Were you also born in Guelph? And I was. Uh, I was born close to Guelph in uh, in Mississauga. Um, so yeah, I've pretty much been in southern Ontario. For wow, we're going to have an ASV life. in western. Yeah, in Ontario. London. In London, yeah. right? Yeah, that's so, correct. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Well, thanks for for joining us today. Yeah, Appreciate no it. Thanks for having me. Let's move on. Hi, I'm uh, Helen Lazier. I'm a postdoc in Mike Diamond's lab at WashU, where we study um, arbovirus pathogenesis. And where did you do your PhD? Um, I did my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I studied HSV neuronal transport in Harvey Friedman's lab. Okay. And uh, I actually grew up in Canada. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Alberta. Okay, so you were born in Canada as well? Um, I was born in the States and then we moved to, moved to, to Canada. Canada when I was a kid. So are you still Canadian as citizen? Or? Um, I have dual citizenship, dual. so oh. I, uh, it can be convenient. You don't have an accent though. <laughs> I uh, 
I, I can, uh, well, Canadians, we can walk amongst you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Next. Yeah, uh, my name's Stefan Oliver. Um, I'm a research associate in Professor Ann Arvin's lab at Stanford. Uh, we work with varicella zoster virus, which causes uh, chicken pox and shingles. Um, a bit of history from where I'm from. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of East London. I then went and did uh, a few years in industry for a small biotechnology company. And from there I went and did a PhD at the Royal Veterinary College, so I've worked a, a lot with animals, and did a postdoc straight out of my PhD there. The PhD program in the UK is quite short, it's three years, and so I did a three-year postdoc. And then I moved to Anne's lab and I was a postdoctoral scholar there, and now I've just moved into an RA position whilst uh, w continuing to work on what interests me. So you were born in the UK? Yeah, born in the UK. In London? Not in London. Um, the best way to describe it for um, people outside of the UK is I, I grew up in a little village just outside of Nottingham. So everyone's familiar with Robin Hoods and that's, uh, <laughs> okay. that's where I grew up. Yeah. Right. And you said you, were, you went to college in the UK as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, my, 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 my uh, education is UK based. Yeah. Where, in, where in the UK did you go to college? Uh, that was the University of East London. Okay. That's a very small college. Cara. Right. I shouldn't say your name, but Cara. Um, so I'm Cara, and my last name's Paige, I guess. I should say You're that as well, You're not sure about right? that, eh? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, so actually, it is Parga. That is the correct pronunciation. Parga? Yeah, it's okay. like lager. Just put a P in front of it. But for simplification, everybody just says Pager, Pager. so I go along with it. Did you have a Pager once? <laughs> no, I ne I've never had a Pager. <laughs> Um, so I am originally from South Africa. I did my undergraduate um, training in uh, Johannesburg at the University of the Witwatersrand. I can't even say it anymore. Um, I did a, a BS, and then so that's a three-year degree. And then we do a fourth year, um, which is considered an honors degree, and I did my masters there as well. And then I moved to the US um, in 2000, and I started my PhD. And I did my PhD at the University of Kentucky with Becky Dutch, and we were studying um, membrane fusion of the Hennepin virus fusion proteins. And now I am a postdoc with Peter Sano at Stanford, and Peter's lab is primarily interested in translational control, and more recently the interaction of microRNA one to two with HCV. So Peter and I overlapped for a day in the Baltimore lab. Oh, <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day. Yeah, he. I gave him my clones and I said goodbye and he came and I, and I went, yeah. And then he and Carla came at roughly the same time and that's where yeah. they met. So I kept in touch with both of them for many years. So. so can you say this sheep retrovirus name perfectly? Sheep retrovirus? Yeah, the Yagsikti sheep retrovirus. That? Oh, how? It's, no. I believe it's Afrikaans for running sickness. What? Uh, mm. Can you spell it? I'm sorry. J A A G. S I E K T E. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know Megan Shaw by any chance at Mount Sinai? I just met her last night, actually. So I also said, "Are you from the UK?" She's no, I'm from South Africa because I did the same with you. But uh, she she speaks. Uh, very well. She said it perfectly, this Yagsit. Because I said, y do you know this Yagsit? And she says, no, 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 that's not the way. <laughs> she, she pronounced it really well. And finally... I'm uh, Matt Doherty. I'm a postdoc in uh, Harmeet Malik's lab at the Fred Hutchins and Cancer Center in Seattle. And uh, I grew up in New Jersey. And went Kitty, to... Kitty, so did I. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Where? Where? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What exit? Isn't that the joke? Um, I was born in Patterson. Oh, wow. And then Fantastic. it got hairy in Patterson yeah. in the sure. 60s. So we left and moved to exit 172, which is the last exit on the is. parkway. Bergen oh. County. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up about 30 minutes west of Patterson in a town called, actually, a town called Sakasana. But Sakasana, yeah. I oh. know that. Okay. Most people don't. Where'd you go to uh, college? So I went to a school called Wesleyan in uh, oh. Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Sure. Um, and then I moved to Chicago and worked in a small biotech company there for three years and then did my PhD at UCSF with Alan Frankel working on RNA protein interactions with, uh, in HIV. So, so, um, Harmit, well, you probably know that Sarah was, yeah. she was a postdoc with She Harmit. was his first postdoc. First postdoc. Wow. Yeah. She's going to be on TWIV tomorrow. Ah. 
he's one of Great. our guests. So that should be fun. <laughs> yeah. And he's, uh, he, as I said to you before, he was a guest of ours on mm -hmm. one of my other podcasts, This Week in Microbiology. Ah. Uh, which we did, was it this week? Maybe it was TWIV. I don't remember now. We did both at, the, at an ASM meeting last year in New Orleans. Uh -huh. So... It was great. I had him and a couple of other virologists. I can't even remember who they were. There was a phage guy from Pittsburgh. Who It's terrible. I can't remember his name. But we had a great panel. You should check it out. He was really okay. good. He's good. And he's coming to give a seminar at Columbia in the fall. Oh, great. Good. So let's talk a little, just a little bit more about the work that you do, just to get a sense of um, what you're doing right now. So you're working on retroviruses in, in well, beta retroviruses, you that, said. That's right. So I'm working with... Uh, Sarah Wooten, and uh, she postdoced in Dusty Miller's lab at uh, at the Hutch, and uh, these are the, the two we work on: the two uh, simple beta retroviruses, uh, JSRV and ENTV. They're very closely related, and what makes them particularly fascinating for us is um, that the envelope gene is or protein is the oncoprotein. Um, so we we know which pathways it's engaging. It's engaging both the PI3K AKT pathway as well as the mech ERK pathway. Uh, but we have no idea sort of what's at the top of the pyramid. What is it engaging with in the cell to actually turn on these two pathways? Uh, so one of my projects is, is to probe that, try and figure out what is at that top of the pyramid that's allowing OMV to in induce the transformation in the tumor genesis. Uh, we have a, a few clues. Um, while we don't know what it's engaging with in the cell, we do know that there are certain domains within the cytoplasmic tail that are uh, very important for the transformation. Uh, one of them is a tyrosine-based motif. It's a YXXM. And uh, a lot of people were very excited about this motif initially because when they um, mutated out the tyrosine to phenylalanine, for example, uh, you no longer got uh, transformation. Um, uh, you know, in, in some people's hands, there you still get a little bit, but it was, it was certainly greatly reduced. Uh, and people were excited because that YXXM motif would have been... Uh, uh, consensus binding site for PI, the P85 subunit for PI3K, and then you know you got AKT and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there's absolutely zero evidence to suggest that there's phosphorylation of that tyrosine. No one's been able to find any binding of uh, PI3K, and in fact, there's a there's a substantial amount of evidence, both uh, pharmacologically as well as genetically, that it, this is certainly not the mechanism by which uh, the AKT pathway is being stimulated. Um, so now we are looking at it uh, kind of with fresh eyes with uh, as a motif as, as a whole that YXXM uh, could be acting as an endocytic or a, um, a post-endocytic sorting motif. And so that's kind of the angle we're, we're taking now. And uh, some of the evidence to support this is uh, if you actually start mutating out that fourth position, that methionine to alanine, you get reduced transformation. If you go with isoleucine or leucine, you get something called a super, super transformer, so you get increased transformation. And if you put a non-hydrophobic amino acid in there, so basically anything else, you get no transformation. So it, it's, that motif as a whole seems to be very uh, important for the, uh, for the transformation. We're, we're investigating that at the moment. So the, uh, all the intermediate steps that, and you remember I spoke with Massimo Palmieri recently about this similar problem, and he had mentioned the same issue that all the steps in between haven't been figured out. How do you do that? Uh, is that something you're going to do, or is that going to be beyond your time in the lab? <laughs> well, I, I guess it depends on, <laughs> on how long I get to stay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less than two years in, so I'll be two years mm -hmm. in starting in, uh, in November. And uh, we have done some, some pull-downs, and, and we do have uh, some hits that we're working on off of that. But the, uh, one of the problems is... I mean, if you search, if you have a hit X, Y, or Z, and, and you search that hit in cancer, um, it, you know, there's just so much out there that could be involved in oncogenesis. So it's really weeding through all these, these hits or these possibilities that we have, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll hit on one. But, I mean, it's not necessarily just a single interaction here. It could be multiple interactions, because we, we do have activation of two pathways. Mind you, there is crosstalk between the two as well, so it, uh, It'll be interesting. We have a, a few candidates that we're, we're, we're looking at, but uh, nothing, nothing concrete so far. How much time do you expect to spend still? You're in two years, you said, right? Yeah, so I'm on a fellowship right now, which uh, is up at the two-year period, but uh, Sarah has recently extended me um, some more time, so I'll probably be uh, another year. Um, I, I personally, I feel that two years, is, it's a tough mandate, I think, sometimes um, to get... Um, 
to the quality publication you probably want to be at. Uh, I think adding the third year will, will certainly be extremely helpful, but especially with that project, since it's somewhat of a fishing expedition, um, you know, I would, like, I would love to see it through, but if I can at least lay the groundwork, uh, that would still be very good. I think three years even is short. I mean, my view, since I, I was a postdoc for three years, and since then it's gotten longer and longer. So, because, you know, all the, low, all the low hanging fruit is gone and it gets tougher and tougher to do experiments. So, it might take, so I wouldn't worry about three years as long as you can stay and get something done. But yeah. what's next? What, what do you see next for you? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't, so I've spent a long time in, in, in academia. Um, and so that's kind of the world I know. I, I have really no clue uh, what it's like to be in industry, and, and maybe you can touch on that later, Stefan. Um, but uh, ideally, I would like to stay in academia and, and become a, a PI. Uh, easier said than done, obviously, especially in the current economic climate. Yeah. That's what uh, you want to do, though. But that yeah. is what yeah. I want to do, yeah. And if you did another year or two postdoc, you think you'd be ready to do that? Um, yeah, I, I suppose it depends on the, uh, well, how do you mean ready? Ready in terms of a CV or ready in terms of I, I feel capable of? Capable, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, do, I do believe so. Um, I have done, uh, my grad career has been somewhat long because I, I didn't do the direct transfer with the PhD. So uh, I spent several years doing master's uh, and then actually came back to the same lab um, and did a PhD. And, and now moved on to a uh, postdoc. So uh, I feel, if I'm being honest with myself, I feel like I, I can generate ideas and I've, I've seen different management styles uh, in terms of how to run a lab and how to manage your people. Um, but I do recognize that I, do, I need more training at this point, but probably you know, at the end of four years, I would feel mentally prepared. Whether my CV's prepared, well, that's, that's a whole other issue. That's another right? issue, but, but I, yeah. Yeah, I think mentally, I would, I, would, I would feel comfortable. And uh, you would you like to stay in Canada, or does Preferably, it yeah. yeah. Again, and that's just a, a comfort issue, but uh, also my, uh, my wife has a, a career that she really enjoys. Um, she's working with an organization she's always wanted to work with. Um, and that somewhat keeps us bound to Canada a little bit. Plus, we have family there. I recently had a child. So, uh, yeah, ideally, I would, I would like to stay This guy's going to be in Guelph. You'll wait and see. <laughs> He's going to be a professor in Guelph, and you're going to spend your whole career yeah. there. Well, like I said, I'll just try to <laughs> wait for someone to retire and move into their office. Okay. And, uh, that sounds like a good point. Uh, I also should probably mention I, uh, I did switch uh, viral families. So I did my PhD with Peter Krell at Guelph, and he's a bacula virologist. So I moved from... Uh, sort of a large double-stranded DNA virus of insects into these uh, beta retroviruses. Why did you do that? Uh, basically to get outside of my comfort zone a little bit, broaden my experience. So now I have invertebrate experience, I'm getting mammalian as well as animal experience, which I think is, is very important. Now you've got to move into those in vivo systems. And uh, I have the opportunity to get both small and large animal experience working with mice as well as uh, the larger sheep. So. But when you do have your own lab, you probably have to work on this retrovirus or a related retrovirus, right? Um, well, not necessarily. There's still, um, there's still a good, uh, well, a decent um, interest in funding uh, basic research out of mammalian. So I could work on both baculovirus as well mm -hmm. as... Okay. Uh, as, as well as the retroviruses. And, and ideally, that's what I would like to do. Um, you know, kind of the idea of have several irons in the fire um, and, and, uh, and see how that works out. Maybe you should work on wasp uh, yeah. Yeah. polydenoviruses. Well, those, those cool. polydenoviruses are fantastic. <laughs> my, uh, uh, my PhD advisor, Peter, he started in polydenoviruses. And, and yeah, they are extremely fascinating. So are they viruses, you think? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a discussion for... For other time. people, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a tough call. I, I've heard someone actually argue that they should be considered, um, what was it, extra chromosomes or even organelles within. That's interesting. Within. So I was tweeting this morning and I said, are they viruses? And, and Welkin Johnson is a retrovirologist, you may know. He said, there are no more viruses than mitochondria or bacteria. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's an organelle, right? Yeah. right? I think they're just defective viruses, like endogenous retroviruses. They went in, they got broken up, and, but they were viruses. 
You know, like you guys, when you retire, you're not, you're not going to be virologists anymore. Yeah. <laughs> just, just stop working. No, you're still virologists. So this was a virus, and it will always be. Anyway, that's my own thing. Helen, tell us a little bit about uh, what you did, or what you do as a postdoc. Yeah. So I'm a postdoc in Mike Diamond's lab at, at WashU, and uh, in the Diamond lab, we study arbovirus pathogenesis. So um, that's for flaviviruses, such as West Nile virus and dengue virus, um, as well as alpha viruses. Um, like uh, chikungunya virus or Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus. Um, and the work that I've been working on in particular has been looking at West Nile virus and um, the role of um, different interferons in controlling uh, viral replication and pathogenesis. Um, and so we know that uh, type 1 interferon is very important for controlling West Nile virus replication because if you infect mice that lack the type 1 interferon receptor, they're highly susceptible. They, they die very quickly. Um, and one thing that's interesting about the type 1 interferon system is you have some, you know, dozen or more uh, type 1 interferons that are all signaling through the same receptor. And these different type 1 interferons are conserved throughout evolution. So it's sort of interesting, why do you have so many of these different uh, cytokines that are all signaling through the same receptor? So um, I've been doing work using different knockout mice and different antibodies to try and um, dissect the role of specific type 1 interferons in controlling, uh, controlling the infection, as well as looking at factors involved in sensing the infection and initiating interferon production. Um, so that's what I've been working on in the lab so far, um, and I've been in the lab for three years, so I'm starting to think about um, what sort of projects I might want to develop to take with me as I um, hopefully go to start my own lab someday. Um, and I'm thinking that I'd like to start looking um, more on the insect side of the arbovirus pathogenesis equation um, and looking at the, the way the viruses interact with the insect innate immune system um, as a, a, a slightly different question than what we've already been looking at in, in mammalian cells. Yeah, it's becoming a really interesting area. People are getting, people ignored that for years. I think there's a lot of really interesting biology that happens when you have a virus that has to um, replicate into very different hosts. I mean, at the, the most basic level, uh, insects and, and uh, vertebrates are different temperatures, and, and then the differences just go on from there. And I think that constraint um, re results in some, some really interesting biology that um, is just sort of waiting to be yeah. studied. And also part of the question is the the virus can't kill the mosquito outright, mm -hmm. so there has to be some kind of balance so it gets transmitted, right? One thing that's um, sort of interesting about arboviruses compared to um, a lot of insect viruses that are insect pathogens is that um, arboviruses, so that, that usually means flaviviruses, alpha viruses, and bluniviruses, don't in general cause a lot of pathogenesis in their host. Um, and to me, that suggests a pretty delicate interplay um, but between the virus and the and the insect or or, um, or arthropod vector. So it's, is it your goal to have your own academic lab? Yeah, that's this? what that's um, you know definitely what I I'd, I'd like to do. And so what about the issue of taking something from a PI's lab? We didn't we didn't <clears throat> go over this with you, but how how does it work in the, every lab is different. How does it work in the diamond lab? Um, well, I guess I can't say for sure because I haven't done yeah. it yet. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's good to have open communication and talk about um, from pretty early on what your interests are um, and what your goals are and make sure that um, you're able to come up with something that you, know, you all kind of are on the same page about, about what's happening. Um, you know, it, at least in, in our case, there's a lot of different projects going on in the lab. There's no shortage of work to be done. And so I think as long as you, um, you know, have these discussions early on, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Early transparency, say up front, what can I expect? Do I get to take anything? Because some PIs will tell you you can't have anything, right? That's the extreme. And others, the other extreme is you can do whatever you want. So it's good to say it up front. I, I think the other thing that's important is to sort of think about something that you can do that's still relevant to the, the research going on in the lab because you, you, of course, want to be working on it in the lab, but is different enough that you can distinguish yourself later on. You don't want to set yourself up to be the competitor of the lab that you just left that has, you know, a, a tremendous advantage over you in your new lab. Um, so there's um, some uh, delicacy in, in, in selecting a, a topic as well. Well, the idea is that you will go beyond. You will extend and find new areas and 
that will reflect well on your training. Absolutely. Right? Because in my view is that <clears throat> there's nothing I can do better than to send people out who do great and do better than I ever did because that said I trained them well. And that's the ultimate. And that way science, I mean, if, it's, if you think it in terms of science, that's the way it should be. If you think it in terms of individuals, then maybe that's not the, the best example. <laughs> so it's all, it's all a matter of philosophy. But in science, it's an independent thing. Everybody uh, has their own philosophies. So uh, in a couple of years, you'll be done. Do you feel you'll be ready to run your lab? Um, I hope that I will be. Um, you know, and again, um, you know, there's the question of whether uh, you, know, you feel ready, whether other people think you're ready. Um, and I, I think there's a number of different things that have to come together for that all to happen, but uh, I'm working towards that. So what do you think you need to be an attractive candidate for an academic job? So you, uh, you probably know um, the answer better than I do in terms of probably having sat on committees that decided who, who should get academic jobs. But um, it seems to me that um, what you need is a good publication record because people are looking for a, a, a demonstrated track record of productivity to show that you know, you're able to um, get projects out, you're able to, to complete things, um, and then um, some, a, a good research proposal, so a plan about what you're going to do in your lab and what's the research that you're planning to do. Do you have good ideas? Um, are they... Are they things you can reasonably achieve? You know, do you have a reasonable plan about how you're going to um, achieve those things? And of course, people are always looking for um, a, a track record of funding, or, or better yet, if you're bringing funding with you. Yeah, I think those are all good things. The funding is is obviously getting more and more important. If you have a, some kind of funds nowadays, you're more attractive. But um, in my day, it wasn't necessary at all. But it's, it's very different. It's a long time ago. But yeah, the productivity, the track record, having a... Um, Having something that you can say is mine and you can develop it is really important. An independent system that you develop and you're going to bring in and you have ideas for the next five years or so, that's really important as well. And uh, I think you can get that in a good postdoc. That's what the postdoc is for. Right. Stefan. I, well, if I could just jump in and add yeah, something to that too. And, and, and this is something that I've always thought about as well. Like all those are uh, sort of the paper strengths, the the, the things that get your foot in the door. And so I also think that delivering a very solid presentation when you, when you give that seminar in front of the department uh, is really what you're going to use to sell yourself. And so that's why I think, uh, um, and this is something maybe advice that I would give to grad students. They, sometimes they get so afraid of, of giving an oral presentation, but you really need to work on those skills. And so come to th conferences, and instead of, just ticking off that poster, uh, really go for the oral presentation because you're only going to get better by practicing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, with the, my graduate program, we had lots of opportunities to talk, and it really helps. Yeah. I agree. I think giving a great talk, and also when you meet the faculty during your job interview, be interactive. Have looked at what they work on and talk with them about it. Be curious, right? Wow, this is really, this was stuff is cool. Can you tell me more about this? You know, and look like you're really on fire, and you should be. You shouldn't have to fake it, right? <laughs> well, I think yeah. being able to communicate your research is key, right? I mean, if you can't, you know, explain what you're doing, what you're interested in, why it's important, and why, you know, you should be able um, to be able to continue this research, um, you know, that's that's really important. I was just going to say, I know that when. Uh, people are interviewing at the Hutch, one of the things that maybe isn't on the form in terms of, you know, who's going to get it, get the job offer, but certainly goes around is, is this person going to be a good colleague? You know, Absolutely. is this somebody that, yeah. you know, you're going to want down the hall to, you know, run into and talk about, you know, either their project or your project or, you know, somebody else's project. But um, I, th I think it goes both ways. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you want to have um, good colleagues, right, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember when I was looking at jobs, I looked at a range of places, and I would ask people, what do you think of this great place? What do you think of this kiss of death? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> I, won't make it, I won't mention any names. But yeah, you have to find a place that uh, you can achieve, and uh, your colleagues are going to be good. You need them to help you. So I felt my first five years, I, I got the right collaborations to move forward. If I hadn't, if I'd gone somewhere else, I wouldn't have had it. So that's really that's a good point. Yeah. 
Stefan. Tell us a little bit about your work. What I'm currently doing? Currently doing, yeah. I'm currently doing. Well, I uh, am currently working on uh, the glycoproteins that are important for herpes virus entry, uh, which are GB and GHGL. Um, and specifically what I'm working on is actually a cytoplasmic domain motif, a YX6Y motif that's uh, implicated in um, how the protein was taught, how the proteins to traffic um, uh, from the plasma membrane and endocytosis. But I, I've got a slight twist on that, and I think I've identified potential phosphorylation on that tyrosine residue. So what I've done um, over the last uh, year is actually put together an R01. Uh, we got that funded, um, so that was really cool. That was really good. good. Um, and what we've done, we have these nov uh, this novel uh, fusion assay system where we can measure uh, membrane, uh, we can actually measure fusion events individually. And if we substitute out the tyrosine residue for phenylalanine, we get aggressive, um, or we get more fusion. And actually when we take that uh, residue and we put it into the virus, we have a nice reverse genetic system. Um, it causes very extensive syncytial formation. So our uh, in vitro assay that measures fusion recapitulates what you see with the virus. And for me, what's interesting is that um, varicella zoster virus, VZV, um, naturally forms syncytia, like a lot of other herpes viruses, but it doesn't form expansive syncytia. So when you put this mutation in, it forms expansive syncytia. And as far as I'm aware, very little is known about the function of syncytia formation. It's just a cause of, say, transfecting in a fusion protein, or it's particularly um, a fusogenic virus that just causes syncytia, but nobody actually understands why it happens. So I now have a system whereby looking at, um, at this fusion and the syncytial phenotype, and actually when we put it in our animal model, we have a human skin xenograft model, and this uh, virus that causes extensive fusion, um, we can't actually isolate virus back from the skin tissue. We can get it to replicate in, in cell culture. It's slightly defective in its spread across the um, cell monolayer, but when we put it in tissue, it's, it's, we don't get virus back. So I'm kind of on the fence of, of where to call it, of, of what actually syncytia, the function of syncytia are. Is it some sort of, um, perhaps some sort of cellular defensive mechanism that gets triggered? whereby you get syncytial formation and that restricts the spread of the virus? Or for VZV, um, is it a requirement for the virus to allow the virus you know, to, to propagate to high levels and then spread out? Kind of leaning towards the former at the moment with uh, our recent data that we just got. Um, and that's, that's kind of okay. what we're looking at at the moment. So what, what, is, what is the ultimate goal with this? What, what do you want to learn? Essentially, I want to um, tease out the, the functions of the cytoplasmic domains of glycoproteins, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of effort and, and research into the ectodomains mm -hmm. and understanding receptor binding and uh, how these affect fusion and entry. Because GB is thought to be the, the major entry component. But very little work is done on the cytoplasmic domain of glycoproteins in general. So I've, I'm using this currently as a model system to look at the effects that you can have um, on the virus just by mutating the cytoplasmic domain. And it's, it's clear from, from the literature and from people's work um, that the cytoplasmic domain uh, is there to regulate um, fusion. If you, if you make other mutations or other substitutions, or if you um, isolate syncytial viruses, um, herpes viruses, you'll often find uh, a mutation in the cytoplasmic domain. Now, whether that's a trafficking um, issue or whether there is some sort of signaling component, which is what I'm kind of geared towards, um, we don't know. So it doesn't have any role in assembly of the particle? That could be something, but the electron microscopy that we've done, we see, we see virus particles and they look just like wild type. Um, and it really is, uh, if you, you know, there's a lot of thoughts that the glycoproteins are important for nuclear egress. I've got this lovely picture of a, a, a virus particle coming out of the nuclear envelope, so it doesn't seem to affect that. Um, so there's, 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 there's virus particles produced. It just seems to be, what's fascinating is, is the rate at which these things kind of, the cells fuse together. Uh, if you look over 
sort of 24 hours, uh, the classical way that the VZV spreads, if you do some sort of fluorescence microscopy, is you'll see the individual cells, and then they, you see these, um, the, the, the infection going across the, the cell monolayer. Um, and then you'll see syncytia start to form as the plaque starts to form. With this uh, syncytial phenotype mutant, what you'll see is you'll see extensive fusion, you'll see the nuclei all bunched together, you'll see contraction of the, the cytoplasm away from the rest of the cells. And it finds it difficult to actually uh, then move from cell to cell. It can't spread any further. And I think that's purely because that the, the cytoskeletal network is, is completely disrupted. If you look at the inside of the syncytia, you'll see the, the nuclei all browned up. You'll see all the endosomes and the TGN, the transgolgi network, all, all bunched inside. And so herpes viruses require those components to actually um, assemble and then propagate themselves. Yeah. So is this a system you developed as a postdoc in the lab? It is, yeah. yeah. So now you said you're a research associate, is that's, that correct? That's correct, yeah. So what's your long-term goal in that sense? So my, so my long-term goal is um, to move into a faculty position. Now, where to do that? You so see, now I'm a little bit confused, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I, I'm in a wonderful place to, to sure. do all this exciting work. You know, um, the system that I developed is, is based on a, a system that's been used in stem cell biology. Um, so I have a, a lot of interactions with them. Um, we have some fantastic sort of mass spectrometry facilities. You know, we've got a lot of facilities that we, that we can use. So. I want to use those for, for the grant that we've written, and it's been put into the grant. So where do I then go? You know, if I go to a, another university, am I going to have that same sort of support network? Could you take your grant with you somewhere else? Um, it's been talked about, and that's uh, that's an theoretically that. possible. Yeah, possible. Right. Yeah, and you have to have the same facility. It's something we were just talking about. You have, and they want people around you that are right. Right. Stanford right. is a great place. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's exactly. hard to find. <laughs> And, and, and if other questions come up, you know, we've, we've got so many different departments that you can just kind of stumble into and say, hi, you know, can you help us with this problem? So you're pretty independent right now? You can d guide the work and work? I, you know, I, I've been fairly independent throughout my career, um, just with the nature of the, uh, the style of work that I've done. I started in industry. I worked very closely with my supervisor there, and we, we worked on experiments together. Um, I had to come up with experimental design. Uh, it was a lot of pharmaceutical formulation preparation, so I had to do that myself. And so I had to organize um, technicians to help with the work. When I went on to do my PhD, when I first started my PI, it was just me and my PI. I, I was the only one in the lab, pretty much, at that point. There was, there was some overlap with, it, with another uh, uh, postdoc at the time. But essentially, throughout the whole of my PhD, I was, uh, it was me, and that was it. Uh, so I came from a very small lab, um, did interesting work with, with Khaleesi viruses, so it was a um, small RNA virus, and I switched into a, a large DNA virus. <laughs> um, and so throughout that, I was, I was very independent, and it helped actually going into industry before I did my PhD, because I could just hit the ground running and then just churn out, churn out the work. Um, and then I actually stayed and did a postdoc in the same lab, and fortunately I had, uh, we had a, an MSc student come back and actually volunteer his time to help out with the research. And that was, that was actually a fantastic help, great guy, um, and he really helped push work. So I have a, a fair amount of um, experience with controlling kind of small projects um, and actually guiding people to do the work as well as doing the work myself and writing, you know, writing the papers and getting it all together. Sounds like you're ready to have your lab entirely of your own, right? I think so. It's just up to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to yeah, find one. Yeah, so yeah. what do you need to do that, do you think? Um, well, I actually went through kind of a, a few applications a couple of years ago. And what became very um, apparent at the time was that I just didn't cut it. My, I, you know, I have a, a reasonable publication record. I just don't have those high, um, sort of high-impact publications. And to me, that seems to be where the criteria is the most critical, because once you get that, then they're going to say, okay, well, they've done excellent work, um, and they'll probably start looking at the funding, and then you'll get invited for interview. So I've worked towards that. I've tried to strengthen my publication record. I now have um, a piece of work that I hope is interesting to other people. It's certainly interesting to the NIH, so I'd hope so. Um, and 
I can now hopefully use that to, to persuade um, search committees that I'm a reasonable candidate to, to have on their faculty. You mentioned um, the management experience that you got from being in industry and being able to manage a small project. And I think being um, a good manager is one of the skills that's really important to having a successful lab, but it's not something you're ever trained in or selected for. Um, and I think that's a real problem in that you, know, you have to be able to manage you know, and supervise people. You have to be able to have a budget. You have to be able to um, handle you know, supplies and, and, and all this stuff. And that's not... That's not really part of your training and... and uh... There are ways of getting around it. Um, so the Stanford Business School, they have, um, with their MBAs, they have this leadership program. And so I actually participated in it. And um, they basically get, so their first year MBAs come in, they do this leadership program, and then they give it to everybody else. And so it doesn't really help you with ordering and everything, but it does help you with... Um, identifying what sort of leader you are, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. And I think that that really helped. Um, so, you know, there are things that you can do, I think, to try and help you prepare in that sense for having your own lab and having to be a manager of people. It's just an idea. It's true that it's not part of the postdoc yeah. training. You have to sort of observe, right. pick up stuff and say, well, I'm going to need to know this. Well, I think it's good if you have an opportunity to you know, have a student to supervise, sure. that you can get a lot of practice um, in how do you manage someone. Because I think when you start your own lab, you know, those first people in your lab are really important. You know, if you have one technician and, and a graduate student or maybe just an undergrad when you're just getting your lab started and you need to be able to sort of know how to, how to manage those people. And so there are opportunities to get that experience as a postdoc. You just kind of have to seek it out a little bit. Yeah, I try and have summer students for my the they're they're like a really come, good way, right? you know, if, if you have people coming into the lab and you've, you know, you've got that little project that you don't have time to get done, they're, 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 they're perfect for that. You can just um, have them go away, you can tell them to do, you train them to do these experiments and then they can then start applying it themselves, but that's a great way to sort of people manage. I think the summer yeah, student is good for the first experience because it's a yeah. fixed time. It's not, oh my God, for five years I have to <laughs> train this person, and they get that first experience. and. Uh, that, that helps. Yeah. But, so it's kind of a haphazard thing. Yeah, there's no, it's not like your experiments where you know you're learning exactly how to do these things and do it on your own. It's haphazard, unfortunately. It's sort of the nature of it. I guess it's another filter that selects for people who can pick this up on the first year <laughs> in your lab and do it, but not everyone can. But I would say that if you can't ask for help, and that's where the colleagues come in, you go to your colleague, I don't know how to make up this budget, help me, right? That's why if you have good people who are going to help you, they'll, they'll do that. Well, and maybe you can speak to this. Is I, I would assume there's a, a mentoring system generally. Most departments would have a mentoring system for junior faculty who are coming in, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, we, when, I, when I started, so I, I started my job in 82. <laughs> there wasn't a mentoring system. But over the years, we, we put one in place. We would assign people to look, to look over the new faculty and advise them. And uh, it you know who to go to if you need help. So, you know, one of the, one of the recent new faculty, I, I approached her and I collaborate with her and I, she always comes to me with questions because she knows that my door is open. So you sort of, you make these, you tell people, let's do this experiment. And by the way, if you have any questions, just come by. So it sort of naturally comes in place too if there's no formal pro program to do that. I think that um, something I became aware of during my um, postdoc as well is that you hear about these mentoring um, opportunities for faculty but it's also important for postdocs as well mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I've had to sort of actively go out and seek but it really does make a difference it's not just having your own PI as your mentor but other people. So let's talk about your work a bit Cara. So I'm with um, postdoc with Peter Sano and um, his lab focuses on interaction of microRNA 1 to 2 with hepatitis C virus and um, when I joined his lab I was really interested in how viruses basically escape um, RNA metabolism so either subvert it because they need it as, as in the case of you know, they have to translate their genomes or you have these other um, this other part of RNA metabolism that we don't really focus on and that's RNA decay and so the virus RNA has to be equally susceptible to the, to the machinery as cellular mRNAs. 
And so I've always been curious as to how does the virus a you know, get around that. And um, when I started in the lab, I started looking at individual proteins that are localized within RNA granules, in particular P bodies, which are um, granules in the cell that um, where RNA decays, occurs, or um, mRNAs are stored. And um, what was interesting was that just before I joined, there was a paper that, in fact, two papers that had come out that said that components of the microRNA risk complex actually localize in P-bodies. And since HCV actually needs this microRNA 1 to 2, I became really curious as to, you know, is there some sort of interaction between P-bodies and HCV? And what we found is that actually HCV lands up dispersing Peabody. So, of course, the question then is, you know, why is it the possibility is maybe it's trying to get rid of these potentially hazardous components, but the virus doesn't seem to be degrading them. And instead, what I actually found is that the virus is redis uh, redistributing them. And um, it seems that for some of the components, it's actually redistributing them to assembly sites. So HCV assembles on lipid droplets. And I find these factors there, which is really interesting. I mean, here you have factors that are associated with mRNA decay, but they're there at assembly sites. So I'm really interested in it as to why is the virus using these? Um, I mean, the possibility could be that maybe because these factors are associated with mRNAs, you know, they might be involved in trafficking of the mRNA, maybe from sites of replication to assembly sites. Um, Maybe they help with strand selection um, for assembly, um, which you know which MR, which RNA gets packaged or not. Um, so that's really what I've been interested in. Do you in. know what part, what viral protein does the reassignment of? No, the not yet. But that's an inter that's something you'd be interested in. That's something in, I'm right? really interested in. Um, so I know that. Um, so we see the the co-localization of these proteins with the uh, viral capsid protein core. Um, and I don't see it so much with the non-structural proteins. And, but I don't, I'm not able to see an actual interaction by IP between these two proteins. Um, so I think that there's probably something in between um, that's causing the relocalization. Um, and maybe it is through the interaction of the, MR, the viral RNA as opposed to the actual proteins. So is, this is something you can take with you? Yes. So we were talking about this earlier. <laughs> so I was very fortunate when I interviewed with Peter, almost off the bat when I walked in his office, he said, whatever I develop in the lab, I can take with me. He's been incredibly generous that way, and he's lived up to it. Um, so I've just recently um, accepted a position at SUNY Albany, and I start on September 1st. And after I accepted the position, I walked into his office and I said, okay, these are my projects. This is what I want to try and finish up. You know, this is, I don't know what to do with. And on one of my projects, he just said, you know, this is completely your project. Take it with you. I'm, I'm not going to be working on it. Um, go for it. So I've been really fortunate that way. I, uh, an anecdote I have for you. When I, when I left David's lab, um, I was work so we had just sequenced polio and there were these little open reading frames in the five prime non-coding region. We didn't know what they were. So I said to, I want to David, I want to continue working on these, right? And then Peter, within six months, had been working on them. And I, I remember I went back to, to, to the lab to visit and I said, ah, David, I said I wanted to do this. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> But it was okay, I wasn't working on them, but I just found it. If I had been, I would have been upset, I guess. Well, I know um, one of the faculty members in our department, John Boothroyd, he actually has a contract that he signs with his postdocs wow. when they leave as to what they're going to be working on. Mm. And um, mm. I think that he gives them a five-year period as, as to that he won't be working yeah. on that. Mm. Um, and in that way, it's in writing. But I don't have that with Peter, but I don't think I need it. Yeah, I, do, so. I don't think you do. So was it hard for you to find a position that you liked? So yes and no. Um, I sent out a lot of applications, yeah. and I only got one interview, and I got the job. Wow. So <laughs> <laughs> you only need one. <laughs> this is true. Um, so it's um, at SUNY Albany, and um, they've just started up this brand new institute, the RNA Institute, and the idea is mm. that they want to use RNA um, as a therapeutic. And so they have different, many different aspects of people working on RNAs. 
and one of the positions that they wanted was an RNA virologist and looking at the job description of what they wanted I fitted almost to a T. Um, so I was very happy about that and mm. clearly I did. So Are you happy with the colleagues you're going to have? I am very happy with them. Um, they are very, dis you know, many, many different aspects. Um, it's in a biological sciences department so there are people working on evolution um, as well as a good number of my colleagues are working on RNA. I am the only virologist, um, but they were very good when I interviewed about uh, in introducing me to some people at the Wadsworth, um, so that at least I would have some colleagues in the area if I needed to reach out for reagents or ideas in sort of aspects that maybe RNA biologists couldn't help me. Um, so, and this is uh, this fall you'll be going. Here. Yep, I start September first. So, do you have any advice for your? colleagues here? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Fit the job description to a team. <laughs> yeah, well so I, I really think that I was lucky, um, but obviously it's more than that because I interviewed other people as well. Um, I think, uh, it, as you were saying earlier, just sort of write a really good proposal. Um, make sure that you target them. One of the things I found that was um, good is to try and uh, to look at who is in the department and see if you can identify with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, not necessarily hone your proposal towards them, but it certainly gives some sort of um, commonality. Um, I don't know what else. Is there anything that scares you about going there? Oh, everything. <laughs> 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 um, I think as much as I feel that I'm absolutely ready to have my own lab and I know that I can generate my own ideas, it is just so daunting. Um, you go from being a graduate student to being a postdoc and you're still at the bench. Um, and you don't have the pressure of having to get money and look after people. Um, and yeah. so from that aspect, I've, I'm absolutely <laughs> terrified. <laughs> but at the same time, really excited because it's a new opportunity. and. Um, you know, this is something that we've been working towards all of our careers, and now actually, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, are, are you starting to write your first grant proposal, or you're thinking about it? I am thinking about it. Um, so, I, in my, my mind, I'm thinking about well, I need to obviously first get my lab set up. But um, one of the first um, grant deadlines that's coming up is for the Liver Foundation, and that's in December. Um, so that will probably be my first one, and. Um, Actually, while I've been here at the meeting, I've la spoken to um, a number of um, program officers at the NIH as to try and get their ideas on what it is I need to do to try and prepare for my R01. You know, what are the expectations? Um, what are some of the pitfalls of some young investigators? And they've been really helpful. Um, so you're going to be a new investigator yep. for, until you get your first R01. Exactly. And that's, that gives you some slack, a little break. That's what everybody says. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. <laughs> so I've been on study section for a long time, and uh, it does help. But then as soon as you get one, you're no longer a new investigator. <laughs> so that's that. But anyway, congratulations. Thank you. Best of luck. Huh? And I uh, <laughs> hope it all works out. Matt, tell us a little about what you're doing. So as I said, I work in uh, Harmeet Malik's lab at the Hutch. And as you know, because you've talked to Harmeet fairly recently, uh, what he's interested in is sort of genetic conflicts between different entities. And several years ago, uh, mostly through conversations with virologists around the Hutch, he started getting interested in kind of host virus antagonism. Um, so these sort of host virus evolutionary conflicts. And um, this led to a bunch of, you know, sort of great work looking at cases where we have host immunity genes that are antagonized by viral factors or host immunity genes that are chasing after viral factors and then looking in the hosts so to look you know across species to see how susceptibility is different among these viruses you can see that these factors the host factors are the ones that are sort of most rapidly evolving in these primate genomes and are in these mammalian genomes and what I started doing when I came to the lab was uh, started looking not at factors where you know, so we knew about ApoBec, and we knew about, you know, protein kinase R, and we knew about, uh, you know, TRIM5-alpha. And these were factors where we would predict that there would be this sort of arms race. But what I started doing was looking at factors that we don't know what they do. Um, 
to try to see, but that we're, we're showing this signature of very strong, very rapid evolution. Um, to try to use these as kind of an argument that these should be factors that are, are uh, really important for host fitness. So uh, if we see this, sign this evolutionary signature, it has to be important. Um, and if we see this evolutionary signature of rapid evolution, it argues pretty strongly that, that this factor is engaged in some sort of evolutionary conflict. And so essentially saying these are the factors that are going to be most critical for host fitness against some pathogen. Um, so, so this depends obviously on having g total genome sequences, right? No, so... Uh, you know, we, we can kind of start with the published genomes that are out there and get a preliminary guess on, you know, if a gene is 100% conserved between, you know, humans and New World monkeys, then... You need multiple species, at least. Then, right. right. Even um, if you have one gene, you need to have... You need to have a species. few species. Yeah. Okay. And then w what we spend a lot of time doing is actually then sequencing things these out of, you know, all of the species that we can get our hands on. So... Other hominoids, other old world monkeys, other new world monkeys. You need to go to zoos and collect. <laughs> Some of it's uh, from primary tissue. Most of it's from cell lines that have been okay. derived from these species. Um, so, then taking these lists of genes and saying, all right, what what are the factors that look interesting here in terms of positive selection, and what are the factors that look interesting here in terms of you know potentially mediating some sort of antiviral function, and why would they either why would they be evolving under positive selection? So the, the case that I'm working on right now is a family of genes that are called IFITs that are, um, when I started two and a half years ago, uh, were pretty poorly characterized in terms of what they were doing. Um, now they're hot. Yeah, and now I was they're, about to say. Now yeah. they've, I mean, your lab in particular has kind of blown them up. Um, <laughs> so, I'm sorry? Yeah, there's, um, I'm not personally working on those projects, but it's, it's a huge area of research in the lab right yeah. now. Yeah, so, um, so uh, those papers were actually uh, really interesting in terms of showing, you know, I, it, it, getting to this first point that these factors are actually really critical for the host response, right? Because all we had at that point was essentially an evolutionary signature that argues that they're, they're important. And then, you know, a the papers from the Diamond Lab and the papers, this newest paper from the Sen Lab, is now showing that these knockout mice are actually really susceptible to viral infection. But again, it doesn't necessarily tell us what they're doing. Um, and so to, to, to get at that, one of the other things I've learned, mostly in my training of, in the world of HIV, is that viruses are really good at providing us with tools that tell us what, how things in cells work. Um, so... The protein I studied in, in uh, grad school was HIV Rev, and I mean that just opened the entire field of nuclear export up. So uh, the, the goal was to start finding viral factors that were antagonizing IFITs. Um, and actually it was an observation in the, the Diamond Lab paper that said that uh, West Nile and mouse hepatitis virus were pretty sensitive to IFIT2 overexpression, but the vaccinia virus didn't look like it was that all of those pieces suddenly converged. I actually remember reading the paper and thinking, this is it. i got to look in vaccinia virus because that's where the antagonist is going to be. And so I screened through vaccinia virus and have now isolated a viral factor that appears to be antagonizing the system. And now, again, that sort of opens up the possibility to take that factor from vaccinia virus and really dissect what that's doing for the virus and really dissect what that's doing for IFIT, I mean, what IFIT2 is doing in the cell and then, you know, extend this to other IFITs that are evolving under positive selection and extend this to other proteins that are evolving under positive selection. So one is, part of that is to take the vaccinia protein and check it against the different species that's right. of IFITs, and, right? Yeah, and already we see that, um, right, so that's one of the arguments that it is actually the vaccinia factor that's driving the evolution and, in fact, you know, there's a very related uh, species that we can already see is, you know, there's basically one amino acid change that can confer specificity, and that's an amino acid change that we see happening over and over and over again in this protein. So if the virus you're looking at is vaccinia, what is the host species that 
you're you're looking for an interaction with. Yeah. So th- this is this is one of the tricks about this um, this argument is that everything that we're looking at is on extant species, um, and yet the, the argument is that the thing that drove this evolution happened, you know, millions of years ago. Um, f- so. Vaccinia is, you know, just sort of the model pox virus for us. We don't necessarily know what actual pox virus drove this evolution. Um, conveniently enough, you'd almost think based on, you know, evolutionary rates of viruses and things like that, that the thing that happened three million years ago or six million years ago that drove this evolution would just be gone now. And in fact, what we often see is that that's not the case. So either these viruses are using the same strategy over and over and over again, or they're converging on the same strategy. But it often happens that the factors that are important in current day viruses work as sort of a nice proxy for what we think drove that evolution, you know, millions of years ago. So you ask that because you don't know, we don't know where vaccinia came from, basically. Well, and we don't know where it came from. And it's, and it's, Wherever it came from, it's presumably not a human virus. And, and so That's most, right. most pox viruses that we think about, their, their natural hosts are, are rodents. Right. Um, and so I was you know, wondering, are you looking at, at yeah, ifits so actually and rodents? The, or are you the, looking in the Right. So I, I am looking at ifits and rodents um, because that's actually where we see this interaction happening. Um, so actually the, the logical place to look is a virus like Ectromelia, which uh, for reasons is you know, not quite as easy to work with as vaccinia virus where, you know, I'm collaborating with Adam Jabal's lab who's down the hall from us and already has this system up and running. So um, again, some of this is, is kind of a surrogate approach. And the argument is, is that these viral factors are going to be conserved across. And in fact, this viral factor is conserved across all pox viruses that I've looked at. So even if it isn't the vaccinia virus or ectromelia or whatever uh, factor, it's something like that. And in fact, again, if we look across viruses, we see that this factor is conserved, but its ability to bind to IFIT2 is different in different viruses, right? So there's the host side of adaptation that's happening, but there's also the viral side of adaptation. So that's kind of the, the, the system that we're using as it currently stands. So, so I'm curious. Yeah. Is it just pox viruses or do you think like herpes viruses would have a similar factor? So, yeah, so the, based on the signature of positive selection, which actually is happening all over this IFIT2 gene, um, we, we actually expect that there's a lot of things that are antagonizing it. So, for example, uh, there's a story out of our lab from uh, Nell Zeldi, who's now a professor at University of Utah, working on protein kinase R. And he has very nice data showing that, you know, this pox viral factor, again, K3L is actually antagonizing PKR at this one very particular spot. And yet if you look across PKR, there's antagonists chasing after that thing everywhere, um, all over the gene that are binding in different places. And we see positive selection all over the gene in different places. And so for factors that are being antagonized, what often seems to be happening is they're getting antagonized by different viruses in different spots on the protein, and that's what's giving us the signature of positive selection in different parts of the protein. So I would expect that, you know, IFIT2 is being antagonized in, you know, what, this region of the protein uh, by this pox viral factor, and it's being antagonized by another region of the protein by some other factor. Um, but once we have one factor in hand, we can kind of start asking other questions about some of these other viruses. So to see, again, who is antagonizing and who's not, and what that means in terms of, again, what that means in terms of host susceptibility to these factors and changes in host susceptibility, and even down to the level of, you know, these are also genes that we see a lot of polymorphisms in the human population. So what does that mean in terms of susceptibility to certain viruses? So it's, is it your goal to have uh, an academic lab as well? It is, yeah. Well, how many years away is that for you? Who? Uh, let's see, Harmeet always, always goes through this calculation with me. Um, <laughs> uh, the goal right now is to probably start applying next year. Okay. So, 
So you got a really defined project. Yeah. You, you could take it with you. I don't know if you will or not, but that's not enough to do yeah, your own for sure. map. So what yeah. else are you going to do? Yeah, so again, this, you know, sort of iFit system is, is actually just sort of the, the first example of what we're hoping will be many of these cases. And Wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, a little bit. And I mean, what, what's interesting about this is that, you know, each one of these, I think, will, will give my lab an opportunity to go into new, new areas of biology, right? So we don't know where this, or I don't know where this road is going to take me with IFITS in terms of what sort of biology this is going to, you know, sort of thrust my research into. Um, and, you know, I think IFITS are going to be a great model system. And there's a couple other classes of genes where Again, if we start with the signature of positive selection and we start looking for things that are antagonizing it, um, taking it from the perspective of, you know, how are the viruses trying to defeat these systems? Um, that'll put us into to, uh, a way to discover these new sure. sort of important uh, conflicts. So when you apply for your positions, this IFIT story will be part of it because you yep. want to continue. But you'll probably say we want to yeah. do similar things with other yeah. things yeah. under positive selection. Yeah, right? yeah. Look for more. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a huge numbers out there that you could do, right? There's, yeah, there, it's, it's not an insignificant list. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and again, I'm extremely lucky because Harmeet is extremely generous because that list is not, you know, very small. So you can um, take the iFit yeah. pro project yeah. with you? No yeah. So, and again, I mean, you know, when I joined the lab, he said, essentially, almost anything you work on in here, you, you will take. Um, you will. It, you will take. Well, <laughs> right, right, right. that's right. Um, you can take. Uh, Heaven help it, you if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, again, his interest is actually uh, primarily in... in sort of the evolutionary framework of this. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's actually an entire other side of the lab that works on kind of internal genetic conflicts. So uh, that's, you know, sort of his lab spans a lot of space. So Okay. So let's see, there are two, there are two things I want to cover with all of you. Um, and I started with you. Let me ask you, what scares you about the future? <laughs> uh... Uh, let's see. You could say Republicans. If you <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that. I've had people complain about that. <laughs> uh, I think the, the sort of current funding scenario scares me. Um, I think the, uh, the very large pool of people that are in our position and the very limited pool of positions that are available is, is pretty terrifying. Um, once we get to where Kara is, I, I'm actually significantly more nervous uh, than she seems to be about. <laughs> um, actually, mostly about this idea of, of just uh, having people that you're kind of responsible for. Um, people that, you know, I know when... I was an undergrad and when I was a grad student and now when I'm a postdoc, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the people that are, are mentoring you are, are, you know, are really important to your career. Um, and that responsibility, I think, is a little uh, nerve-wracking, mm -hmm. but... Um, it's interesting. I never thought about that. I just thought I, I wanted to do science and I, I thought everything else would fall into place but you're right that is a concern and maybe the best thing how to deal with it is not to think about it because <laughs> well I, I mean I that may be um, well and certainly there's nothing you can do necessarily Just do to your best it, right? I think right? but yeah be fair and you learn from your mentors uh, right? absolutely and <laughs> I've learned a ton of lessons yeah. from my mentors so that's why um, you, you need good ones because you learn good yep. good ways to deal with things yeah. right yeah how about you JD what are you afraid of um Really, at at this moment, is is uh, just to sort of echo what you've already said. Is um, you know we are graduating a lot more people. 
with PhDs, and and I think that's probably a byproduct. I can remember growing up and coming through uh, elementary school or grade school, whatever you want to call it, and all through high school. Um, you know, education was always touted as you know this is what you want to do. You want to get as much education as you can, and now we're at a situation. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's a great thing for society as a whole. But now we're graduating a lot of people with PhDs, and yet um, due to whatever you you watch in an academic setting. They're basically letting positions go through attrition. So you're you're graduating a lot of people, but then not generating necessarily generating positions for them. And uh, and and so I, I worry a little bit about, like you said, the pool. Very large pool. You come to a- ASV and you see how many talented people are, are out there, and, and 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 you can't help but feel this is your competition when you <laughs> when you go. And, and that can be can be very daunting at times. Um, so I, I guess I'm a little uh, worried about uh, what the, the future in terms of the number of positions are going to be. I mean, it was always hammered into me, oh, your generation's going to be so lucky, all these baby boomers will be retiring, and uh, you know, there's going to be <laughs> jobs for everybody and, and whatnot, and, and, and that's just not turning out to be the case at the moment anyway. Well, science is compelling. People want to do it. Do you think we should limit the number of PhDs. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. No, uh, I, I don't think that's appropriate. Because it's been proposed all. by people, right? We make two. I mean, you know, PhDs are like a Ponzi scheme, right? Yeah. yeah. You can make. You need them to do your work, but they can't all get jobs. Yeah. So it's been proposed to limit the number of trainees. You think that you don't agree with that, though? I don't. I don't think. No, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's something that should be mandated. I, I guess there's also. And maybe I'm it, this because I want to go into academics doesn't mean that everyone who gets a PhD does want to, right? You are picking up a ton of skills that are transferable, yeah. problem solving, thinking out of the box, how to analyze data. So um, I think maybe we need to get better at perhaps identifying other areas that pe- that people with PhDs can can go into. I think yeah. I think also helping PhDs um, build strengths in other, in other areas. So whether it's Science writing or um, business or podcasting. <laughs> you know, something now, is that profitable? That's, <laughs> no, Sorry. No. My wife asks me that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, something that's actually part of the PhD program so that you can actually equip people, one, to pique their interest, um, and two, so that if you can't do, you know, have your own lab because you aren't interested in it, that you are at least trained in something else, or you have exposure to something else. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And, and I've, I've even heard some people, sorry, Matt, if I just, I'll just, uh, who say that uh, they don't necessarily want to be in an academic lab, but, but they feel like they're a disappointment to their, you know, their PhD advisor or, or mentor or their postdoc mentor because they feel like they're letting them down for some That's reason. what I was just going to say. Yeah. Is I that think that it's this... slowly changing, especially with the new, with the younger faculty. So. Um, my PhD advisor, Becky Dutch, um, she had no you know, preconceived on ideas of what her students would do. And I think in many respects, she also tried to identify what people's strengths were to, and what their interests were and to try and help them. Um, and so I think that maybe with the newer generation of PIs that's changing, possibly also with the expectation of that not everybody's going to have a PI position and so yeah that's the new you reality. need to help them yeah. yeah certainly not reflected at this table is it <laughs> yeah, no. Right? Yeah, no, no, there was no <laughs> career here no. well this is not an unbiased sampling i think you guys responded and i think responding is part of the phenotype of wanting to be your own boss in, in academics i think that might be it i'm not sure helen what are you afraid of i mean i think we've covered um pretty much all of the standard <laughs> fears um I do think, though, that it's going to work out. And, and I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but I'm, I'm optimistic. And I, and I think we hear um, a, a lot of really uh, sort of negative um, feelings about in terms of, you know, it's a, it's a pyramid scheme and there's no money. And, um, but I know that I love science and I love um, doing bench research, but also thinking about the ideas and putting um, proposals together. Um, And so I I want to go start my own lab, but I feel confident that I'll be able to find somewhere where I can do science in in some sort of capacity. Yeah, I think that's important to have confidence. You want to do something, so you're going to try it and get it to work, right? That's great. 
Uh, Stefan, anything, anything else scare you besides what we've talked about? Not being able to have the opportunities to do what I'm doing. doing. You know, that's um, why I'm here. I, I do science because I love science, right? We, you wouldn't want to, you know, I really do like it. It's one of those disciplines where I think that you have to really enjoy what you're doing, otherwise you're not going to keep coming back. It's <laughs> too yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. no other yeah. reason to do it unless Crushes you love it. Spirit a little too much. <laughs> yeah, you know, in, 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 even when things are really not going well for months on end, you still have to come back and you still have to be able to pick yourself up to do that. Um, so what I'm actually scared of is not being able to do that, to figure out the problems, being, have the opportunity to come back and actually solve the problem that I'm after. Um, and so, so not getting a faculty position actually scares me at this point. And so it's kind of the same thing that everyone here has said, that maybe there's not positions out there. So, but, um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to um, give up just yet. And I think that's kind of reflected in why I've spent so much time as a, as a postdoc. Um, so, yeah. All right, I have one more thing to ask you. We've got 10 minutes or so. I've kept you a long time. Um, I, we all know there are problems with science, the science research, the whole system of working. So I want you to tell me what one of them, in your opinion, is. What's wrong with science uh, as you see it? What, just one thing. Let's start with you, Kara. Oh, feel the pressure. <laughs> in what respect? Anything, <laughs> in any you can, respect. anything you'd like. Or maybe you don't think there are any problems. Uh, oh. I mean, that's fine, too. Can I come back to you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm passing so you back. <laughs> <laughs> huh. um, you can also say there aren't any problems. That's fine. Yeah, some, somehow that doesn't ring true to I me. I just want to get a sense <laughs> of what you feel about this. That's, that's why I asked you that. Yeah, I guess um, maybe two things that I just thought of in the course of this conversation. One is in terms of academic science, it seems like what you were saying doesn't exist, I think, or is maybe going away, I think still does exist pretty strongly in academic science, which is just this pervasive idea that you have to become just like me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that you have to go into academic science because I see a lot of people who, kind of like you said, like don't necessarily want to go into academic science and yet feel like they should. They should, okay. Um, the other thing I, uh, that makes me a little bit nervous is the trend towards, um, I don't know what kind of hot water I'm going to get into here, but sort of the trend towards translational I science. knew you were going to say that. I could um, tell. <laughs> I, come, I come from an extremely sort of basic uh, background, and even, you know, even though I'm working on you know, sort of primate pathogens and things like that, I mean, you know, fundamentally the things that... that excite me are still questions about how do molecules recognize each other and how does that evolve and how is that adaptable and things like that and uh you know that i think is is a potential real danger to the the direction and freedom that scientists have to go um is if things head even more down this road of your science needs to be translatable to get published in a high profile journal or to get funded or something like that. Okay. JD. Yeah, you know, just to follow up on, on that too, I think one of the problems, I call it a little bit of scientific snobbery, if you will, that uh, you could have a very interesting story uh, on some organism that just doesn't resonate, shall we say. And uh, I've heard of people who, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong on this, that they'll send it away. It doesn't even go to review because they send it back and, and they're like, I've never heard of this organism. It, it's just not popular enough. And, and, and so I, I really don't care for that sort of attitude. It should really be, if it's an interesting story, if it can really contribute to the foundation of knowledge, then I think it's, it's, it's worth publishing in those higher end journals. Um, and, and so I guess that's one problem. Uh, another problem with, and this will just be selfish from me because of my personal situation is uh, I have run into um, a school of thinking that says, uh, you know, you cannot, you need to 
move around. Now, I understand you need to move around labs and you need to get see different training environments and you need to you know spread your wings and get out of your box. I don't necessarily think that means you need to leave the institute that you necessarily did your PhD at. And, uh, and, and maybe as, as uh, people become more aware of familial issues and, and whatnot, that that'll change. But uh, certainly in terms of writing for fellowships, it, uh, it, it comes up frequently. <laughs> right, uh, that, you know, that's, that's an important point, that there should be, and I've often had the same thought, there should be, okay, yeah, it is good to move around. I've moved around a lot, so I'm not a good example. But I've often thought that why aren't there more programs encouraging people within the ranks to be pushed forward to the top at that point. And maybe that would alleviate some problems in some circumstances. But uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a really important point that it, it shouldn't just be focused on, well, you've done your PhD here, now you've got to go and leave. You know, if you've got an interesting story that you need to pursue, why not, why not, why not pursue it? This is exactly right. And maybe that is the best place for you to pursue right. it. Right, you know, if, yeah. if you're in the best place to do the, the, the work for that particular project, then. Yeah. I know, sorry. No, it, it, no, it's, that's good. I think it actually says on one of the fellowship websites, only under exceptionally rare circumstances will we consider um, applications. So that means they'll even just wow. pretty, much, yeah. pretty much set them aside. Okay, Alan. Um, I, I think we've touched a little bit here about the importance of having high impact publications so that you know your, your science nature cell. Um, but uh, recently there's been, I think, a real proliferation of new journals. Often these are open access journals. And I think um, the movement towards open access publishing is really great in terms of um, getting information out and making it accessible to more and more people. Um, it does mean, though, that there's a, um, an exponential increase in the amount of, of papers that are being published. But um, I, I don't think any of us have had an exponential increase in the amount of time we have to read the literature. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure that the, the proliferation of publishing is matched by an increase in quality research. So, um, you know, as, as we all are, uh, go through the literature and, and try and, you know, put together proposals and do background reading on things, I think that's something that's going to be a growing problem in, um, in scientific publishing is how do you sort through all of this growing body of literature and how do you weed out the quality from the quantity? Um, and, and I'm not sure that we've really found a, a good way to do it. And, um, you know, there's some point where uh, PubMed alerts aren't going to be enough to, uh, <laughs> to really read through all of that. Yeah, you can't just look at the journal and say, I'm not going to read it, because you never know. There might be a gem in there, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Stefan? Problems in science. I think for me, at, at the moment, um, I, I could think of a couple straight off the bat. Um, but it's, it's, it's somehow ignoring... I just get this feeling that a, a lot of the work that's done in the human field ignores the data from the animal fields. Absolutely. And, and that's, that, that's to me, it's just a folly. We are animals, we're the same things, let's face it. And I we think just it talk. extends out to plants as well. Yeah, and exactly, you know, I, I'm probably, I should probably get a slap on the wrist for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, but, um, so, so trying to get funding, and this was a real problem when I was at the vet college, trying to get funding um, for work in animals on a pathogen that's very closely related to humans was almost impossible. Yeah. And it's potentially because it's just... Um, not seen as a, a good use of money, but I, I somehow think that that's not the case. You know, there's, there's lots of examples of animal diseases that you could uh, study, and they're much more translatable than the mouse model. Okay, you know, everything, you know, at the moment, everything's set up to cure the mouse. All research, you, we can just, you know, go out there and cure the mouse immediately. But um, actually translating that to, to, to humans is, is not easy. So you have to look at the pathogens you know, for, for, for virology research, but it, you know, it goes to other things. You have to look at the pathogens within the host. And there are lots of examples where um, you can take that pathogen and it causes the same disease in the host as it does in humans. But if you translate it to the mouse or try to adapt it to the mouse, it doesn't cause the same disease. So I think that's for me is, is the, the blatant sort of... Um, ignoring of, of the real translational work that you can get from animal research. 
Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Again, maybe I'm biased because I'm at a vet college. But yeah, like there are many excellent large animal models. And, and you know, we can get in trouble with this one. So. <laughs> uh, but you, you can do some riskier experiments with, with, with the animals that, that, you know, you just to do your proof of principle studies type of ideas. Uh, yeah, so I think it's very important. I agree 100% with what you're saying. Why do you think that is? You know, maybe some sort of snobbery between vet schools and medical schools. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, but but I, I have seen, I've, I've, there's an underlying thing that I've seen quite a lot of, that if, if you go to presentations where, where there's an MD talking about a particular thing, more often than not, than not any sort of work that's, that's been done in the same field, but in animals, is completely disregarded because it's not done in their favorite model system. And so therefore it can't be true. However, you know, I'm not going to give any specific examples, but it's, it's just a case of you will see differences between human pathogens in a mouse than you would with the, the no. This is all I study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we talk about differences between, you know, chimpanzees and humans. Right, right. You know, I mean? you, you know and, and to, to expect to have full translation from mouse models yeah. is a real folly. And I, I, I do think that there's... there's too much emphasis on having a mouse model system. There really is. There's something wrong with the mouse. Because <laughs> it has a lot of, you know. You've no idea what it's done to my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, the mouse itself has to tolerate an environment that we don't have to tolerate. It's running around on the floor, coming into contact with all sorts of things, right? <laughs> it's the same with mouse rats, all sorts of rodents. And that's perhaps why they carry the diseases that they carry, because they can tolerate them. Whereas we can't, and that's, that's where we end up with things like Hunin, which causes you know, devastating consequences. So I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's my... Okay. Well, so now we're back to me. After oh, you, right. <laughs> um, just as you were speaking, I think one of the things I thought about was that there really isn't enough money in science. And, um, and I think part of the problem lies in us as scientists that we don't go out and tell people how exciting it is because it's the taxpayer that's paying for us to have fun every day, right? And it's actually our responsibility to go back out and tell them, you know, one, what we've done and um, how we've been spending their money. And I don't think that we do a, a really good job of that. And I think as a consequence, um, in part of that is you have this funding loop problem um, that at least we're now seeing, particularly in this crunch. So are you going to try and rectify that in your own, in your way? But you know, you're going to be very busy with right. starting your lab, right? <laughs> um, I think it really is important to go out and speak. Um, I know the, uh, I had a Damon Runyon fellowship and they had every now and again sort of these, you know, it was fundraisers, but they invited the fellows to go and speak to people. And um, the donors really were excited about, you know, how their money was being spent. Um, yeah. And I think that that's important. I mean, that's speaking to donors, but you know, even going as far as going into schools and telling them, you know, what cool things you're doing, it gets somebody going home and saying, "Mom, you don't know what yeah. cool thing I and heard schools today." Schools are good. That's yeah. a good way. Yeah, I've done schools. that. That's very good. Yeah, to make a big impact. Yeah. I mean, even teaching undergrads. I mean, just yeah. watching the sort of yeah. lights that go Absolutely. on or high school kids or whatever. So I, um, I started teaching a virology course to undergrads and tell them on the first lecture, I'm teaching this because I want you guys to go out in the world and understand yeah. right. viruses. Well, I mean, twins, right? right. It's part of it. <laughs> but I think everybody can do their own little part because you cannot do too much, right? And uh, if you guys just do one thing, you go to a third grade class. You know, I used to go to my kids' class and they love it. You know, I mean, some of these kids a year later, they're still coming up and saying, wow. You know, learn any cool viruses like that. <laughs> just great. So that's a good point. I think we do have to work on it really a lot. And if each of us did a little bit, it would add up you know, right. in our own ways. So, And just to follow that up, engaging the public's great, but unfortunately the, the public isn't necessarily in the decision-making seat. So that's, that's a very good point. I, yeah. I mean, it's not, they'll say, oh, that's cool. Our tax dollars are being spent well, but they're not about to pick up the phone and call their local they're MP not lobbying. and say... You know what? You need to fund science more because maybe we should get them to go yeah. out and lobby well, for it's us. All, yeah, this is it. We almost need a, a lobbyist to go 
to, to you know, I tell my, the my, my classes, my undergrads, I say, you, some of you are going to be members of Congress, and you just remember this when you vote on <laughs> the science bills. But, you know, that's another approach. You start young, and you're going to get eventually, you have a big enough umbrella, you're going to get the people that make the funding decisions. But I think you're right. That's a great place to start is with the public. Because once you have the public behind you, when the decision makers make the decision, there's no backlash or right. anything like that. Yeah. I mean, all of the initial funding that came out for HIV research was all policy driven. Right. Um, well, there the, you know, there's a great need and sure. very clear. Yeah. Right. But there's some there's some diseases where that that's really compelling. But as we've said, there's really basic science that has to be done, because you find out things you never expect, and that's the one underlying theme I always come back to. You never know what something is gonna how something will turn out. You never know how important something is going to be that you work on. So you got to do as much as you can. And then you, you see what comes. But the public really doesn't get that, and so that's what we have to teach in part. Right. Yeah, you have to let them know this is the foundation upon which everything is going to get built. I think you just need to tell them how cool it is. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree really. with that. Because, I mean, almost anyone, you know, my non-scientist friends, my parents, you know, little middle school kids that I've talked to about science, when you start talk, getting excited about a story and you can convey that excitement, I mean, everybody gets excited about it. You know, nobody's going to look at a story and not think it's super cool. One good mechanism are these science fairs. Uh, there was one in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and ASM went and they put up a, a you know a micro booth, and they have people there, volunteers, and they have videos, and they have hands-on things and microscopes, and these kids are just totally excited. Yeah. Yeah. They, they did a video of it. It's on the ASM website. It's great. You know, they said, "What is a microbe?" To you know these kids, and they just filmed them saying, and "You know, mm -hmm. they're going to go home and yeah. be all excited," and especially if they can do some hands-on stuff, yeah. right? So. I think that's important. Okay, I have kept you guys enough. I'm telling you, you guys are amazing. I think, uh, I don't know why, if maybe the people who responded are just amazing or everybody here is amazing, but I'm really impressed with what you guys do. You're eloquent, you do good work. I think you're all gonna do really well in, in what you wanna do. So I wanna thank all of you for, for coming. JD, yeah, thank thanks you. so much. Helen. Thanks. Stefan. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Kara. Yeah, thank you so much for the lot. opportunity. And Matt. Thank you. I want to wish you guys all good luck and uh, just stay curious. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Very similar to the one I had in Glasgow, but with also some significant differences. Now, there is one main difference. In Glasgow, uh, I asked individuals to join me during the day. And for this latest TWIV in Madison, I asked for volunteers. So that's very different. If that were an, a scientific experiment, it would be very poorly designed. So I'm not sure we can conclude a lot from these two conversations, but I think you get a sense for what it's like to be a postdoc in the United Kingdom and what it's like to be a postdoc here in North America. So I want to thank Matt, John, David, Helen, Stephan, and Kara for talking with me. Uh, we all decided that we'd do it again in four years and see where they were in their careers and how things have changed, if at all. And if there is one thing that is true for science, it's always changing. So hopefully we can all keep to our words and do that. I think that would be a lot of fun. As always, you can find TWIV at twiv.tv at iTunes and at the Zoom Marketplace. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, on Twitter at PROFVRR. We love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.com. WS. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>